G'day, I'm Will Anderson. This is Gruen Planet, the show that wonders if the Earth will ever stop spinning. We'll meet our panel in a moment, but first, here's a new take on an ad we've seen before that squeezes maximum value out of not being an Olympic sponsor. We weren't there on stadium billboards. We weren't there on double-decker buses. We weren't on buttons, souvenirs, or commemorative snow globes. We weren't there officially sponsoring anything. We were there for real. Inside the bodies of some of the greatest athletes on Earth. <laughs> brag, brag, brag. <laughs> Anyway, from what I heard about the Olympic Village, it's not that hard to get inside the bodies of some of the greatest <laughs> athletes. <laughs> Speaking of sporting bodies, you may remember hurdling sensation Michelle Jenicky. Oh, that's my happy place. <laughs> Whose pre-race warm-up routine lit up the internet. Check out the latest ad from bookmaker Paddy Power Italy. <laughs> John Stephenson's really let himself go. <laughs> that actually reminded me of another recent commercial, this one from Argentina. Along with summer comes every family's worst nightmare. Dance in briefs. Dad's in briefs. Could have been worse. The original idea was, hey, Dad's in briefs. <laughs> Too soon? <laughs> Gruen Planet for dry and chesty coughs. <laughs> Time to welcome our panel from Leo Burnett, Todd Sampson, and from YNR Brands, Russell Halcroft. I will. They're joined by a transfer legend from Madigan Communications, D. Madigan, and a self described marketing bloke, author, and occasional propagandist, Toby Ralph. Casino ads look pretty much the same. You know the drill. Smartly dressed people on a sophisticated night out enjoying the high life at roulette wheels and blackjack tables. Oh, it's like a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this one, which you might have seen featuring prominently in the How's That ad breaks on Nine on Sunday night. We open our doors to 25 million visitors every year making Crown's Melbourne and Perth resorts among our country's most visited tourist destinations. We contribute over $2 billion a year to the Australian economy. Crown's investing over $2.7 billion, upgrading and opening new attractions like restaurants, bars, shops, gaming areas, conference facilities, theatres and our 2,800 hotel rooms. Welcome to Crown. Restaurants, bars, shops, <coughs> gaming areas. <laughs> Conference facilities. Blink and you'd miss that reference, especially if you saw the other version of that ad, which cuts even that comment out. Now, according to its 2011 report, in revenue terms, Crown makes almost $4 from gambling for every buck it makes from anything else. Todd, why doesn't it want to talk about that? This is uh, corporate reframing 101. So they're not trying to hide that they're a gaming business. I mean, everybody knows Crown's a gaming business. But what they're doing, cleverly, is repositioning it as an essential part of Australian society. It's big, strong, important, dominant business that, uh, that impacts Australia on a bigger scale. They're positioning it as a big, blue-chip, essential company. The, uh, the other thing, about, of course, it's about growth, Will. Yeah, so they know that they've got their gaming revenue. 
But what they need to do and what they want to do is advertise other services that are within Crown because they know that they can get growth via... I know, them. but they didn't mention it very much, did they? Do you think there's, like, people who are rocking... I just came from the giant statue of a horse. Well, I didn't realise... <laughs> <laughs> But again, again, that's deliberate because what they're trying to do is change the definition of Crown. Yeah, so, yes, originally the Crown, the definition of Crown was Casino. In fact, it was called Crown Casino. Now it's just called Crown and what they're trying to do is change in our heads what that brand equals and yeah. it equals more than they've gaming. Got, they've got gaming already wrapped up. But also, I think, by talking about tourism and training and jobs, they're positioning themselves in, as an important part of the economy. Mm. So gambling becomes a necessary evil that people are willing to accept. So they're inoculating their brand against the anti-gaming sort of movement. Yeah, I mean, people think casinos are literally a licence to print money. They're not. You know, when you look at their... They're pretty close, though, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> not bad. But, I mean, if you look at their, their, their sales-to-profit ratio, they're making 11%. Commonwealth Bank are making 33%. Uh, Woodside are making 28 You know, they're right down there with Fairfax. They're not doing that well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Crown spending blitz began in June. It paid about half a million dollars for full-page ads in all of Australia's major papers. Open letters calling for the removal of John Story, chairman of Echo, the company that runs Sydney Star Casino. Those ads were not aimed at the public. Toby, what's really at play here? James Packer wants to build a world-class casino at Barangaroo. But the trouble is there's only one licence, and that belongs to Echo. Now, he bought 10% of Echo. They wouldn't let him on the board. Um, so he's either got to persuade government to give him a second licence or cut a deal with Echo. The chairman's standing in the way and you don't want to be standing in the way between James Packer and his next billion. It's like standing in the way of him at a buffet. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the... <laughs> um, so, you know, John Story, the chairman, was history. If you can't make your case through free media, you do it through ad space, which is what he was trying to do. But, you know, coincidentally, when you drop half a million dollars into a newspaper coffers, all of a sudden the editorials swing your way, which I'm sure is like a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> Eight days after the ads ran, a story fell on his sword. End of story. <laughs> um, come on. The Echo Board... <laughs> oh, no, that's too much. <laughs> the Echo Board told the Australian Securities Exchange the campaign run by Packer was damaging the company. So, Dee, was that advertising or bullying? Advertising is always about getting people to do what you want. But in this case, he was kind of trying to get control without paying a shareholder's premium. And if bullying is using superior strength, or in this case, superior amounts of money to kind of force people to do what you want, it's coming pretty close. The great thing about advertising, Will, is that it's... <laughs> one, one of the great things... <laughs> it's always the big <laughs> ...is it, it can be relentless. Yeah, so if, if you're a newspaper editor, you've got to think of a new headline every day. But if you're running advertising, you can run the same ad, full page, day in, day out, and just be relentless with your perspective. The other great thing about it is that no editor's getting in the way. Yeah, so you've got your point of view and you smash people over the head with it. It's fabulous. The thing, the, but, uh, the, the, the thing that's interesting here, and I don't know why everyone gets really shocked that the Packers have used their influence to actually oust a chairman, because it's not, it's not, this is not unheard of or happened before, but mm. some of the most powerful brands in Australia, hands down, are the families. If you look at the Packers, the Murdochs, the Stokes, the Fairfax, now the Reinhardts, uh, they all have one, one thing in common, other than the billions, is they control the media in some way, shape or form. They either control it through ownership or through influence. And in this case, they use their influence to get what they want. The good thing is they used advertising to influence. Yeah. Yeah? And, so and they just didn't ring up the editor. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. They didn't ring up the editor and say, hey, son, can you please write an uh, editorial that goes like this? They put their perspective in a piece of advertising. They gave the media half a million for, for it as well. So this is, this the is good The commerce. difference is, though, if James, if James Packer phones up and says, hey, I'm thinking about running some ads, would you mind running an article? There's a high chance that's going he doesn't to be on the front cover, which he, happened with the... He doesn't even industry. have to say it. doesn't even have to but say it. Just run the ads. This is quite a new phenomenon where, where rich companies or families or whatever kind of use advertising to lobby. It's lobvertising, which is mm. kind of a new thing. It's not new with mergers and acquisitions. So when the mergers and acquisition trail is happening, plenty of companies advertise exactly during that time. That's not a new strategy. It's just... I, I always find it surprising that people get surprised that these powerful families have influence but, in the media. But, but, they used, but in the ads, they named names. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, very personal. that's unusual, but, but um, you know, normally a, a chairman during a takeover campaign can get stabbed in the back, and mm. in this case they just stabbed him in the front. Crown followed up with the TV ad we showed, then more newspaper ads around Australia in the first week of August, proudly declaring its plans for Crown Perth. Perth deserves a six-star hotel. Wasn't five star meant to be the top rating? Todd, can you just <laughs> add stars whenever you feel like it? <laughs> uh, yes, you can. Uh, the star system is primarily marketing. There's very few independent, there's certainly no universally independent star system, maybe the mobile or the AAA, but it's primarily marketing. But remember, when, when we're talking about casinos and hotels, hotels are just the appetizer. I mean, they need to be okay and pretty good, but the real game is in the, is in the casino themselves. So they're, they're moving to these super premium, ultra luxury luxury six-star hotels as a way of just sort of ticking that box for the for the high rollers really I mean there's 30 million Chinese in the premium gambling market that's a hell of a target market so mm. you'd want a six-star hotel yeah the ad says arriving in 2016 why advertise something that isn't opening for another four years Russell are they basically just saying look we understand Burswood's a bit shit right now <laughs> <laughs> but if you wait four years it's gonna be okay well <laughs> I'm not entirely sure why they would do this, Will, but um, a thought. A thought is that um, if you're promoting Crown in Perth, then maybe you can get the Asian people through Perth on their way to the East Coast. Because clearly a flight from Asia to Perth is half... It's half the time. If that is what they're doing, I think it's pretty smart. I think also they've got... I mean, they've obviously got a plan and they understand the negatives associated with their brand, which is problem gambling. So rather than waiting for people to protest, they're proactively making their case beforehand, which is a much smarter way to do it. That's exactly right. I mean, the casino model is pretty straightforward. You know, you give me 100 bucks, I'll give you 70 bucks back. And you keep on doing it until your money's gone. It's like a stupidity tax. <laughs> Uh, at the bottom of the page was the name James Packer. For the last decade, he's been your standard reclusive Australian billionaire. Now, suddenly, he's out in public. The PR rebuild began in May with a 60 Minutes bromance with Carl Stefanovic. You know, there's you know this feeling in Australia that, that there is something inherently wrong with gambling. How do you overcome no, I, that? I, I, I push back on that. Yeah. I think that some people say that. I think the vast majority of people don't have that view. I'm really sick of people, you know, you know, looking at me as though our business is some sort of sinful business. I am hugely proud of our business. Our business made, in 2011, $340 million after tax. We paid $680 million in tax. So we paid twice as much tax as we made in profit. Kiss him, Carl. You know you want to. <laughs> Supporting the public good through tax. Nice one, Jamie. Hang on, that's hardly the Packer family creed. Of course I am minimising my tax, and if anybody in this country doesn't minimise their tax, they want their heads rent. Because as a, as a government, I can tell you, you're not spending it that well that we should be donating extra. <laughs> uh, Toby, how would that 60 Minutes piece be put together? Um, well, I reckon it probably helped that he owned the company just before then. Um, <laughs> and it's hardly a hard-hitting in interrogation, you know, I mean, it's not. Uh, Kerry O'Brien or Adele Ferguson from Fairfax. It's Carl Stefanovic, which is <laughs> I like being licked by a puppy, isn't it? <laughs> a oh. drunk puppy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Packer is absolutely doing the right thing by fronting the media himself. Um, I think Australia's actually vaguely fond of James Packer. I, I bit... think they, they feel a bit sorry bit for sorry. him. Yeah, because his dad was yeah, tough. A... <laughs> but he needs, he needs media advice. Yeah. And he's probably genetically incapable of taking it, but he needs it. Well, we know one person he's not going to be getting it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was wrong with Grumpy? Distant might be a Scientologist, James. Dee, why is it so important to humanise him all of a sudden? He's from a wealthy family and it's inherited wealth and he's in gambling. Those are two things that'll probably work against him in terms of public sentiment, so he needs to work doubly hard to make sure that he remains likeable. I just think he's doing his job. He's, do, yeah. he's doing his job. He, ultimately, he's the, chase, he's the chief salesman for his organisation, and he is doing the job that he ought to be doing. I think the 60 Minutes interview, though, is... If you take it for what it is, it's just clever. It's a packaged piece edited. But don't you think that that interview was so obsequious that it, it would have worked against him because it didn't feel at all like journalism? That's it for felt... people sitting on this show. Oh, the, I'm people... not sure. <laughs> I, think, I think it was I... so... It was just like, oh, God, I, I needed a shower after I watching think... this. I thought it was... <laughs> it looked like a, an episode of The Billionaire Wants a Wife. Yeah, <laughs> it was. It's like a dating show. Yeah, it was ridiculous. It was, it was... No, but, but 
He's three generations of a media family. Now he's a casino family, and he's trying to make his own way. And the reason he's talking now, because he's finally winning. When he wasn't winning, when he was losing lots of money in Macau and he lost lots of money in Las Vegas, he didn't talk. I mean, the, the guy was, he was probably depressed at the time. Now he's winning. Now, and so now he's putting his face out publicly. And I, and I think good on him. In an interview with The Australian two weeks ago, Packer returned to the subject of what Crown does for a living. Listen up for the C word. But, you know, we are in the integrated resort business. We're not in the... You know, we're not, we're not in the other, you know, we're not in... That's the part of the business we in. Go on, James, say it. It's only three syllables. Car, C, no. <laughs> Russell, do they really think that integrated resort is going to fool us? There's a really interesting thing. It's called marketing myopia. Theodore Levitt wrote, wrote about it. And it's the, the idea is that if you narrow your focus in business, then you'll fail. So what you have to do when you define your business is give it the broadest definition you possibly can, and as a result of that, you will grow. That's all, that's all that's going on here. It's just terminology that you really shouldn't make public. But don't you think also the word casino is so politically loaded? Yes. Um, and you need, when you, you need pollies on side. You've got to give them a word they're happy to use, and casino is not it. I think that he... Uh, I think... Integ what is it? Integrated... Integrated resort. I think... <laughs> I mean, that sets off the bullshit alarm. Yeah, yeah. Status. <laughs> but I think what, what, he, what he could have done, which is true, is he could... Because I think there's two things going on here. I think that he wants to position Crown as a luxury brand, a worldwide luxury yeah. brand. And I think you'd do a head shake on that. And the other thing is, is I think he's insuring, and I think it's smart for them, I think they're insuring against a heavily regulated market. They know that gambling is one of the most regulated and going to be more regulated. So talking about it as a luxury brand or as a, an integrated hotel or whatever they're calling it... Just broadening the definition of the offer is what they're doing. For strategic escort. reasons. It's an escort course. agency instead of a hooker. It's yeah. kind of just... <laughs> Basically, what it is. Although at most escort agencies, you get something back for your money. <laughs> yeah, I, re I reckon you get fucked at both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Packer's key selling point to the public is that his new Sydney casino will attract Chinese tourists, bringing jobs and money. So the casino will milk foreign cash, not Aussie. Toby, does that work as a PR message? Uh, Yes, it does, actually. You know, I mean, casinos uh, get $4,100 every second of every day, all year, passing through them. Australia gets about 120 bucks of that. Vegas gets about 300 bucks, and the casinos in Macau are getting about $1,400 a second. They're vast. By 2020, there'll be 100 million Chinese travelling, middle-class Chinese, and 80% of them want to go to a casino. They're either going to come here or somewhere else. This is yes. something that we're going to hear more and more, this terminology we're, we're selling to the... We're selling middle class to the Chinese middle class. Yeah. This is... It's only just starting to come into language now. We're going to hear it more and more in five years, ten years, fifteen years. Part of Australia's ongoing success will be the fact that we have sold to the Chinese middle class our middle class. Mm. I love that the entire future of Australia is based on the idea that we will sell them shit we dug up and then try to win it back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there's only one question Packer should be asking himself. WWPD, what would Palmer do? <laughs> what would Queensland billionaire Clive Palmer do if he wanted to get a casino built? He'd announce it as if it's already happened which he did three weeks ago with the $2.5 billion Palmer Coolum Resort upgrade. Clive's new casino will come with theme park, wildlife park, 20-storey sky needle and hovercraft. <laughs> Here's what he told Sunrise when asked why he was doing it. Why does New South Wales play Queensland State of the Origin football every year? <laughs> why do we want to go to the moon? We want to go to the moon because it's there. <laughs> And because when we get there, we can build a whacking great casino. <laughs> Sorry, integrated resort. <laughs> Ruin Planet, one tool does it all. <laughs> now, spin cycle where we count down our favourite recent publicity stunts. At number three, Michael Phelps in hot water for a fashion endorsement. Photos of a new campaign for Louis Vuitton surfaced on the net last week, after the Olympics, but two days before the end of the non-sponsor blackout. Some suggested Phelps might have his medals stripped. Others, that it was a cheeky plot to generate headlines. We figured that fully submerged is the only way he knows how to piss now. <laughs> 
I just hope he was really stoned. He's like, dude, the pool has shrunk. <laughs> At number two, Mini, which showed a gold medal ingenuity to drive around advertising restrictions at the Olympics. But Mini has a lot of PR ground to make up. In Germany, brands can buy naming rights for the weather. Mini paid 300 euros to name a storm front Cooper in February, giving weathermen the chance to refer to Cooper on air as it wreaked havoc across Poland and Ukraine. <laughs> Death Toll 70, <laughs> Mini Nil. <laughs> At number one, the very latest publicity meme, the sadistic vending machine. In London, Kenneth the Talking Coffee Machine has been harassing passers-by. I'll tell you what, if you give me a hug, I'll give you a free cup of coffee. Yes, man! Now, how about a kiss? People doing whatever a machine tells them to do. <laughs> Humiliating themselves for the chance to win basically nothing. That's not advertising. That's Big Brother. <laughs> Guru and Planet. You couldn't be in better hands. Now the pitch where we ask advertising agencies to take on thorny real-world briefs. And at the risk of turning this into an episode of Who Wants to Be a Billionaire, we move from Jamie and Clive to Gina. This week we've asked our agencies to come up with a campaign to convince Australia that Gina Reinhart would be the right owner for Fairfax Media. <laughs> Can they do it? Please welcome from Loud and Clear, Joel Beeth, and from Cooch Creative, Ron Samuel. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, Joel. How did you break the news, mate? Well, there's a saying in advertising that if you can't say it, you should sing it. So we decided that we'd create a tune that would get all of Australia singing along with us. Oh, let's have a look. We're a lucky country, but thanks to Gina... We've got spare cash up our sleeve. So thanks for digging and buying the stuff. And selling it overseas. And saving us from the GFC. There's a new job and we need her. Because Fairfax is losing readers. The facts aren't fair. I'm sure, are Aussie viewers. Let's your own devices. 